Hey guys, how's it going? We are talking about Atlanta in this one. First and foremost, I want to get some things out of the way. One, I will be at Atlanta this weekend, so I will personally not be doing a live show this weekend. Sheets may or may not do them. It depends on what his schedule is. I'm going to say probably no to Sunday just because it's the you know NFL week one, and I doubt uh, you know people are going to watch one. Now, I will continue to do them for the rest of the year going forward, as I've always done for NASCAR during the NFL season. I always do them early Sunday and stuff, and for every slate. It just clearly this weekend I'm not going to be able to because I'm out of town. Um, secondly, just a bit of house cleaning for those of you who are possibly new viewers. Uh, if you would like to join us in any form or fashion. If you use promo code NFL20, you get 24% off your first one month package. Whatever package that is, it is uh, 24% off. And if you are a new user who are, who is interested in a yearly package and or a current user who is interested in upgrading to any of our yearly packages, if you use NFL or if you use the promo code NFL20, you get 10% off the uh, package uh, when it go when, when we're talking yearly packages. When we're looking at Atlanta in this race, I this is probably not going to be a video that I show much on screen outside of just the one sheet that I have. And the reason being is it's probably just going to be me talking more and analyzing Atlanta versus the other plate tracks and just what we look at. And so what we're looking at here is the sheet that I made during the offseason, what I've been goofing around looking at um, in terms of trying to gather data for Atlanta, okay? And if you're familiar with my content and you saw it earlier in the year or during the offseason, possibly when I made it in like January or so, my hypothesis has been that Atlanta races very, very similar in terms of skill set, in terms of requirements, in terms of layout, and in terms of how races are playing out as Daytona did before the repave after the 2010 Daytona 500. So, very quickly, for those of you who maybe haven't seen this sheet before, this is all of the all the Daytona races going from the 2001 Daytona 500. Big RIP to the man in the sky. And then it goes to the Daytona 500 in 2010. What you're looking at on your screen is this left side is the starting column, or the starting position, rather, for all these races. And the numbers that you're seeing here is the finishing position of that starting position. So, you know, if we look at, you know, good old uh, Daytona, I do believe, did Earnhardt finish 8th, maybe, 11th? Pretty sure he's 8th, could be wrong. But anyway, uh, we look at good old Michael Waltrip, started 5th on the day, won the race. That's why you see a 5 here, you see a 10 here, 4, Junior, and whatever lucky guy, you know, Sterling didn't kill. You know, this is possibly Sterling here. Whatever the case may be, that is what we are looking at here. Now, yet again, this video is going to be more me just talking about how I look at this track and probably not really even about drivers. So I'm sorry if you aren't a fan of that. But when we're looking at Atlanta, okay, and uh, also explain the rest of the sheet, I have the four Atlanta races since the repave here. This is where, you know, Starting position is here. This is where each individual driver has finished in those situations, or where that starting position has finished, rather. Now, yet again, we only have five races at Atlanta. Xfinity races drastically different, and trucks race drastically different. I mean, you could argue that trucks are more similar to the Cup Series, but still, I'm not trying to interlude or, like, mingle that data together. When we're looking at Atlanta here, and we look at these five races, all I'm looking at is the average finish for these positions. And so what I've done is made a column for average finish at just Atlanta, average finish for those Daytona 500s that I'm looking for, and the average finish of both of those combined. Now, you might say, Brandon, you're working with a small sample size for Atlanta. Yes, I know that. That's the whole reason why I do this or why I'm doing this. And my hypothesis was when this was repaved that it would race similar, like we would see more similarities of where positions finish um, compared to old Daytona. And yet again, if anybody else is bringing up old Daytona, I doubt they will, but that is, that is all on me. Nobody else has, uh, been bringing this up since, since the start. And oddly enough, we see quite a lot of, uh, similarities just kind of right off the bat. And, and some things are kind of more striking than others. Uh, we, you know, and yet again, it's also a situation of trying to debate and tell what type of outliers the two, Atlanta races where the pole sitter was optimal at, because clearly I would advise never playing the pole sitter for these races and stuff. 
and going back through, we see that the pole sitter has finished first in quite a few of these Daytona races. So that's why I wanted to use Old Daytona because that is a situation that has happened. And when we look at Old Daytona, that was a driver's track. And what I mean by that is, now we can debate up and down the street, Daytona versus Talladega. Um, that is not what this podcast is for here, as I've already done that in previous situations. But where I'm at, is Talladega allows the people who know what they're doing, it gives them more freedom to make those types of moves. It gives them more opportunity to make ground up because the track is so wide. Okay, the main issue that we run into with Daytona, and yet again, just stack from the back of Daytona, uh, more than likely you're going to make money doing that. Talladega, you run to an issue that the track is so wide Chaos is not going to necessarily impact everybody at a high rate or at a similar rate as Daytona. Now, it's still very high. I mean, at this point, we're just deep in the weeds and stuff. But I would argue that more skill in each individual driver or, ver or maybe not versus that, but I think you could tell the, the skill of each individual driver and how they approach it based on what they do at Talladega. Typically, you'll see the good plate racers typically perform better at Talladega. Now that's just saying all the time. And I'm not even talking about finishing positions rather. I'm more so, as I've explained how I approach plate racing, it's about identifying where people are going to race. And if you want to use the term sim, if you want to use the term guess, whatever, I'm using it more in my head of where people are at, what their tendencies are, and not only their tendencies, but their attributes of how they approach these races. I mean, very similar to an RPG. I mean, plate racing is, is just Dungeons and Dragons. That's really all it is. Who has a skill level to do this? Who has, you know, uh, a, a negative mana entering this type of race like that? That's how I view these types of races, okay? So when, we, when you combine Atlanta into that, I do not enjoy combining current Atlanta with Daytona and Talladega data. And yet again, we can argue that back and forth, but where I stand, I do not want to, you know, intermingle that, you know, those data points together. I want Atlanta to be its own thing because I think when we look at the craziness of Daytona, especially now, but when you look at what you can find at Daytona, the new, new Daytona, not, not necessarily this stuff, because this is, this is old Daytona. This is when racing was racing, when plate racing was plate racing. Um, when we look at what Daytona has turned into now, what Talladega is turned to now, and what Atlanta is turned to now, I mean, these are three drastically different approaches, to be honest, okay? You have to be aggressive at Daytona for track position. You have to maintain a running position up front nearly the entire race. Yet again, wrecks happen up front, so you're more likely to lose that, but it's drastically more important at, at Daytona than Talladega. Now, you can't go from the back of the field up anymore, but that's typically what the approach is at Daytona. You have to be aggressive of getting up front. Talladega, you can argue that the approach doesn't necessarily have to be as aggressive. Now, you'd certainly want to start pushing with like 40 to go at, at Talladega, but uh, it's it's not that aggressive. And I mean, 40 to go at Talladega is like, what, 80, uh, probably a little over, actually quite a few over 80 miles and stuff. Um, whereas Atlanta, not only do you have to be aggressive like you do at Daytona, I mean, there's no like safe place at Atlanta at all. We've we've seen wrecks happen all over the place. Now we do see an odd amount of crashes at Atlanta happen with the pole sitter or whoever's currently leading or second and third. Typically, whenever I break down wrecks and when we look at them at, at the other plate races, we typically see an accordion effect and we see the wreck potential, you know, really start from like the sixth running position to the 13th. Okay. Whereas Atlanta, it's almost exclusively up front. Okay, we've had numerous pole sitters get spun out. We have, we've had numerous people blow tires up front. We've had numerous people get forced four wide, three wide for the lead or in the second row. So typically, like, you know, if, if you know, a leader and one other guy is kind of by themselves side by side, you have a four or three wide scenario for, you know, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And that runs an issue. Somebody gets in the wall. They, you know, take a bad uh, push into three and four. Like, you know, so... You have a lot of chaos up in the front at Atlanta that I think skews and kind of takes away from combining, you know, where people finish at Daytona and Talladega. I mean, this is just kind of where I'm at talking-wise or where 
I kind of lean towards. Because um, I had to get that out of the way in case people either haven't watched my stuff or familiar with how I approach things. Um, real quick, is you know, going back to this type of stuff on the screen, this is what I'm more curious about. Now, yet again, I'm not really looking for you know a one-to-one -one comparison between Daytona and Atlanta or old Daytona and, and Atlanta. But I think if it's like within like 2.5, 3, 3.5 positions, like I think that's pretty significant uh, as a section to look at here, especially with only five uh, races here and pretty much all these races being different. I mean, we have the fall race last year in under yellow before like a bunch of wild stuff happened. We had two races that the pole sitter dominated, and then we basically have the first Atlanta race and the spring race this year that is different from like the other three that we've ran. So, you know, yet again, we, we really don't have a lot of useful data here and we probably won't have that for another, you know, two to three years of like data that we could like truly, truly look at. That's why I'm, you know, pulling, um, Daytona data in the past. Cause I think that's the best feel for it. And that's what I've uh, wanted to look at. I, I do have to apologize. I forgot to bring the optimal from the spring race before I started this. I'm sorry. But we, I mean, you have a good idea based on just where uh, people finished. Also, I do have the optimals for these races. Now, the Atlanta ones, we, of course, we have. Uh, all the Daytona ones are more so where everybody would be optimal without fast laps available. Because we have the data for laps led, place differential, obviously. We just do not have it for um, fast laps in these races so you, you know it could be up and down depending on what fast laps these were but all these are the optimal lineups if these daytona races were ran with the current DraftKings scoring and you can see that these are all over the place you have stack from the backs you have guys up front i mean you know i'm looking at to see like how likely were those races where the pole sitter was optimal at these atlanta races how optimal does that happen and we see that argument at these plate races and yet again Okay, I think in terms of breaking stuff down, I think in terms of, you know, the content, especially on these races, because I think they're the most fun to look at from a data perspective, I think I have the most uh, to offer in that stuff, and I don't just, well, we stack from the back or whatever. Like, we clearly see that the, the pole sitter has been optimal in the past. As a player, I acknowledge that, and I just say I'm not playing the pole sitter and stuff. Um, anyway, going back to where we're at here as we start getting, you know, the fifth Atlanta race in, we start seeing like quite a lot of similarities between Daytona and what Atlanta is doing, especially with the place differential plays. Now we're going to see that, you know, 22nd and stuff are quite, or, you know, off of where Atlanta is and stuff. And this is going to be dictated by, you know, whatever driver was there and stuff. And, you know, a lot of these Daytona races are, you know, slightly skewed because, you know, the Daytona 500 is based off of duels, so you end up having, you know, good drivers in the back who potentially start, you know, near the ba near the back of the field, um, you know, being in play. But I think that is negated by the fact that we don't have the 43 cars anymore. But we still see that, like, the guy starting 35th at Atlanta, you know, outside of the 36th place finish here, which I would probably assume was Gregson in this one. I don't remember right off the bat. It's not important who the driver is. We're just saying, like, we're, we're looking at positions that are, like, clearly showing, you know, upside of, like, 14, 15 place differential points. And you start looking at where they are in, with, in comparison to Daytona, and there's some similarities that are, like, pretty close to one another. I mean, it is looking pretty, uh, I was going to say spectacular, pretty spectacular, uh, close to a spitting image of, of quite a few stuff here. Okay, and, and the reason why I'm looking at it this way is, yet again, we don't have practice for these races anymore. They go out and queue, and then they're going to go racing, okay? Um, so the best situation we have is, or the best that I assume other people do, is how they do at Daytona, how they do at Talladega, you know, so on and so forth. Um, which, again, I don't really look at their finishing positions. I try and analyze of how each individual driver approaches stuff and, and you know, base my projections and, and points off of that. Now... What, you know, the main takeaway is Atlanta is play the good guys in the back of the field, okay? Not saying it can't happen, but it is less than less likely that we see bad cars finish well. Now, what is your opinion of finishing well and stuff? 
you know, and, and what's the pain of a bad car and good car? I would start to argue that, yet again, as, as I would at any plate race, now despite the fact that we have seen, I mean, we'll look at the optimals really fast, as I said, I apologize that I did not put the one from the spring here, but we look at the last couple, outside of, you know, the enigmas of, you know, these two guys, these pole sitters being there, and you can argue that this one may not even be usable as well because it didn't rain, um, but the likelihood of optimal guys and or you nailing optimal drivers who start in the top 10, you can argue that we see, you know, one, actually we see two here, two here, two here. I would argue that that's an anomaly, uh, especially when you start looking at other Daytona races. I mean, if we look at the races, I mean, we have, what the hell is it, 10, 11 races or so here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. No, I'm just a moron. I don't know how to do math. Uh, we're looking at like twenty races here. How many times do we see at least two? Well, we'll call it one and a half. Screw it. We'll just do one. Uh, how many times do we see? No, I'll use two as a, as a hard cutoff. How many times do we see two guys in the top ten be awful? One, two, three. Four, or I guess four, four times, okay? The reason I'm saying that is, is nailing who the one driver would be who starts from the top ten is extremely hard. Now, you might argue that you need a lap leader at Atlanta. I would argue no. Um, I mean, history would show that. I would say that we're probably not, I'm personally probably not going to try and nail that stuff, as that is very unpredictable, Okay. Um, and very difficult to do. I think you are much better off trying to nail, yet again, at least in the same approach, who are the good guys from 10th and 11th on back through the field, who can finish up front, who can finish top 10 and top 15 specifically. Now, at, at Daytona, we're much more open to a top 20. At this one, we do have to start, you know, trying to nail guys who get who can get top 15s by, like, bare minimum. Um, so that's good teams, good cars in the back, and then so on and so forth. Um... Secondly, as we see that, we typically see that Atlanta has had a lot of situations to where the, like, once we exclude, I mean, hell, even when you look at the, you know, the average finish here, 8th, 13th, 10th, 21st, 24th, 15th, 17th, 23rd, 18th, 14th, we see a huge drop off at 10th, and then we have 19th, 15th, 20th, 14th, 22nd, 20th, and so forth. But there is quite a lot of proven place differential coming through. And really, outside of 30th, which for whatever reason, 30th has been just absolutely eviscerated at Atlanta, you can, the worst projection you can give somebody is like 24th, 25th, okay? Like, realistically across the board, inter, not DK projection, but finishing projection, the floor is like 24th, really, Okay. Yes, people will finish lower than that, whatever. But like that, that's like the baseline projection for a lot of people. Okay, so if you start eighth, you know, twenty fourth is a bad time. You know, that's a, that's a huge drop off. But if you start thirty second, you know, twenty fourth, I mean, that that's a pretty big improvement. But we're we're seeing that, you know, twenty second through twenty seventh has been excruciatingly important, or very important at Atlanta. Now, yet again, this could be skewed because we have so many few races, but then again, you look at the old Daytona races, and we're seeing, you know, 24th through 27th. We're seeing quite a lot of the guys in the back of the field be able to get through. We're seeing the good guys who typically, you know, missed, you know, starting up front because they're set up for the track or they're set up for the race, not necessarily going out for Q. We see a lot of place differential possible in the teens, you know, at Old Daytona and at Talladega. So, like, the prime spot to target in this race, in my opinion, would probably be from 14th to 28th, okay? Those 14 positions seem very important, and I would start by looking at, you know, getting at least three people from that position, okay, if not four. I still am very interested in probably two from, you know, 38th, 37th on back, or from 27th to 30th, 8th on back, but that's how I'd want to approach it, since we're not necessarily chasing all the guys in the back. Now, yet again, I'm, I have nothing against... BJ McLeod, Haley, Cody Ware, keep playing Cody Ware, guys. I mean, Rick Ware's supremacy is on the way. Um, but, like, I'm down to play Spire. I'm down to, like, even Legacy can get there. Like, there's really not true bad teams anymore at plate races. Uh, we're seeing, 
you know, finishing positions amongst drivers get averaged out to, you know, there's really not any huge standouts and stuff. And if anything, it's guys who are just running in the back, like aggressively, who aren't trying to race, who are averaging the better finishes of the last couple of years. Um, but when we're when we're looking here at Atlanta, and I'm looking at the starting grid, and this is just for the Cup Series. I mean, kind of late for that. We're 20 minutes in. Um, but when I look at the Cup Series stuff, and I look at where you know where people qualify come Sunday morning, or you know after the queue on Saturday. When I start seeing good cars in the back, whether and who gives a shit if they have bad finishing positions or not, I want good cars. So like the Joe Gibbs Brigade, the Hendrick Brigade, the Pinsky Brigade, RFK, Trackhouse, um, like those would probably be your top five priorities. And between that, you know, that's like 16, 18 guys in the field. You can grab, you know, if you're running by the the three, you know, people from 14 to 18, you're grabbing a good majority of those guys and or more. Um, and so you, you don't have to get crazy by playing the, the guys starting dead last because realistically their projections are, is going to be right at like 20th for finishing p- position wise. I mean, you look at the last three races of the people who stop outside the top 30. Now, 30 has just been eviscerated, as I said, but you have a rare situation of one, two, three, four, five, really five situations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we'll use seven, uh, including 30th. Really, just seven times somebody starting 30th on back has finished in the 30s. Most of the time, they are finishing in the 20s. Um, now, yet again, if it's somebody who finishes 4th, 9th, 5th, 14th, 13th, 14th, of course, you're going to need them. And, you know, for the most part, you would see, you would assume that those are, are good drivers. Um, but we, just, we don't have to necessarily stack from the back here. So, uh, almost in a complete circle, when people are like, I'm going to try and play the optimal at Daytona. I'm going to try and play the optimal at Talladega. And they start, like, trying to get, you know, stupid accurate with, with where they go. That's negative EV because you're giving up a lot of, you know, potential um, for place differential and, like, a safety net at those tracks. Whereas that's how you want to play Atlanta. Like, you want to try and hit the optimal lineup outside of playing guys who start in the top 10, okay? You want to try and hit the good guys who can make it in the top 15 from, like, 10th on back. Okay, so just because we're not stacking from the back and we're not prioritizing, like, you know, the last 10 starting positions, we can, you know, start putting dots in and and trying to nail where people are going to go and what positions are going to work. And based on Atlanta, you know, we see that, you know, the teens and the 20s are that range. And then, hey, Bubba Wallace is starting 31st. You probably want to play Bubba Wallace starting 31st. You probably want to play a good you know, echelon driver who starts in the back of the field. Um, that's that's how I'm looking at uh, Atlanta. Lastly, as we look at the track and the factors that this track is, is bringing up, we're typically seeing that not only, you know, when we just look at, you know, Talladega and Daytona, the runs are huge and stuff, but it is very difficult to block runs at, at Atlanta. If, yet again, leaning back to skill and drive, if you know what you're doing, you have a real chance of performing well at Atlanta, Okay. Yes, the volatility at the very front is super high because that's just how this race has been playing out. But if you are good at plate racing, you are able to make moves through the field. And unlike Daytona and Talladega, now you still need help at at Atlanta, duh, but you are much more likely to be able to do that on an individual level. Yet again, with as with the old Daytona pre-repave, you could do it on your own, and the drivers who have skill and know what they're doing can get through the field. And I've talked about this in other uh, videos where I'm like, you know, basically doing, you know, uh, what is it, replay prep or whatever, like watching people how they approach. Like you can see who's a good guy and who isn't, okay? Um, and, and you can tell who's smart and who's not, who, who knows how to run lanes, who doesn't know how to do that. Like it's very telling here at Atlanta. Um Secondly, tire wear is, 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 is still going to be huge. Handling is going to be huge. As this track was made to wear, and it is doing that, um, that's going to come into play as well. So you, not only do you want drivers to know what they're doing, you also want teams to know what they're doing in terms of setting up a car and being able to adjust on the fly. Okay, so like, sorry, Legacy, I'm, I don't have much confidence in you guys being able to help Nemechek if he's uncomfortable uh, off, right off the bat, you know? Uh, situations like that. Third most, or third thing, Atlanta has had a lot of patches already in, in the track. 
either by how the track is settling, how things happen. Hell, if you look at the you know front straightaway this weekend, and I mean we've already had like repaves and stuff on the track in general where seams are at, but um, if you look at the second dog leg this weekend, I mean you're gonna see a gigantic square of repave asphalt. Okay, Atlanta, you know runs Monster Jam, runs Monster Trucks in the infield, not the infield, but the trial and stuff. They put dirt and stuff all over the track. And that is part of where the Monster Jam trucks do their shows. Now, we had a Monster Jam truck bottom out on the asphalt in the dog leg during their last show. Atlanta had to cut that asphalt up, repave it, and then it didn't settle correctly. So they didn't have to repave it or take it out and repave it again. So I'm not saying that's going to cause wrecks or anything. But being aware that the track is not only becoming a super handling racetrack, but you also have a lot of repaves going on. You also have, a, I mean, not only repaves, but you have a lot of transitions on different asphalt, which I'm not concerned about that. I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty flat. Like, you're not going to, like, bottom out or fucking, you know, hit, hit, like, a ledge that isn't, like, you know, even with the current asphalt. But you start seeing that type of stuff. And, I mean, that's, that, those types of things do make an issue or do have impacts on how, on how cars drive. You know, when you start running the top side of the track like you do with Atlanta, you are very susceptible to being self-spun, or not self-spun, but being, you know, spun by the air when somebody, you know, puts air on your left rear and stuff. You don't have that nearly as much at Daytona and Talladega because you're much more closer to each other at Atlanta. When you're side-sucking each other, which that is the term, okay, whenever you're like, what the hell are you talking about? What kind of gay pornography are you talking about? When I'm talking about side sucking, we're talking about the air that these cars are pushing into the, or, or the, the hole that these cars are pushing into the air. These are a very, very square body. They're knocking a huge amount of air off compared to other generations of cars that we ran. When you look at the sides of these cars, okay, and you're looking at two cars running side by side and the side sucking maneuver that they do on each other, okay, I mean, hell, even, even you know, rewatch the spring Atlanta race, you'll notice that more so than the other two tracks, yet again, drivers knowing what they're doing, how to maneuver the air, how to maneuver that to either help them or not even help them, but knowing how to get away from the detriments that the side sucking can do to each other. Um, you'll notice that a lot of times at Atlanta, you'll have guys stuck side by side, either two by two, very close together, you know, middle lane squeezing the outside lane by the wall. So you're already getting the wall side sucking the car because that air doesn't have anywhere to go other than back on the spoiler of the car that you're on. It creates a bubble that slows you down on the right side. It adds drag to the right side of the car. When you're on the middle lane, you're doing the same thing to that car on the outside. Okay, so you're holding them in place. When we get three wide of Atlanta, you end up having a situation to where those drivers really can't move with forward momentum. They kind of just equal, I was going to say, you know, in equilibrium, but they kind of equal each other out in terms of what momentum they can do, you know? Um, so ideally, you know, you're a driver that wants to gain positions. You're going to try to avoid being in the three wide situations and, or make those moves very aggressively to get out of side drafting range for these, for these cars and stuff. That's why if you look at the leaders, leaders are being super aggressive and not have guys side by side with them. You typically see the side by side, with the car either in second with somebody side by side or you know in third place with third place like on the outside lane then be side by side with people as they're trying to maneuver their way up the field okay and so you have a high risk of having the car get very uncomfortable especially in three and four the transition between one and two from the trial is much more forgiving as you know you're, in, you're basically, you know, taking the trival as just a long corner. From the exit of four into one, you're turning left the, the entire time. Like, duh, I mean, like, you know, what the, you know what the track looks like. But in terms of what that car is doing, it's not an aggressive change of how the car is set up. Okay? You know, like, when you look at back at the restart wreck last year, I mean, that was like a shifting on a restart issue. But a majority of the wrecks at Atlanta are happening in three and four and out of four because the the not even transition between the banking, but the transition between going straight to a hard left is putting a lot of load on the right side of the car, a lot of load on the right, uh, you know, on the right rear of the car specifically. You're already leaning on that side. Now, granted, you're on the banking and stuff, but, like, that's where the momentum of the car is going. That's why the left, your left rear gets so loose 
and the car is so loose in three and four because it's already shifted all the way to the right. You're turning super aggressively. When you're entering one, it's like a you know a progressive turn because you're already heading that way from the travel. But you're going from a straight corner down to a left, like an aggressive left corner in three and four. That's where all the trouble spots are happening. That's why handling is so important. That's why we see so many people not even you know wreck but get in the wall in three and four versus we don't really see that in one and two. Um, so like we look at Atlanta or we look at New Atlanta. And we look at the characteristics that old Daytona had, or me, rather. I look at the characteristics that old Daytona have, and I think that's a good, you know, data point and data set to have when we're trying to have an idea of what Atlanta's doing, when we're trying to get a feel for what Atlanta's doing, and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, I mean, that's that's my Atlanta preview for the Cup Series. Uh, very much could have just been summed up by play the good guys in the back of the field. But, um, you know, I wanted to break down and, and talk about how I look at it. I love Atlanta. It is the best track on the circuit. It's real racing because short track racing sucks. Nobody wants to watch people go slow. Racing should be all about speed, okay, whether it's racing planes, whether it's drag racing, whether it's racing stock cars. I want to see people go full throttle. I want to see people go fast, okay? Go to Atlanta. I cannot implore you. Atlanta honestly might be the first track to add grandstands. We've been tearing them down left and right. They put those grandstands back at three and four. I think I think they could book them. I think they could sell them pretty easily. Atlanta season tickets one hundred and ten dollars. No excuse to not grab season tickets to Atlanta. No reason to not buy tickets to Atlanta. You can see the entire track everywhere. There are no dead spots. Very comfortable. Very easy to see everything that happens. You're on the bottom row of any part of the grandstand. You can see the entire field down the back straightaway, no obstructions. Atlanta is the best track on the circuit. This is what racing should be. Any other track is dumb, okay? That's uh, that's my selling point on Atlanta. Uh, hope you guys have a good week. Hope you guys have a good time with NFL Week 1. I will see you guys back in live shows next week and previews for whatever race is next I have no idea where the Cup Series are at. I go week by week, um, but that's that's where I'm at. Hopefully this helps you out or gives you an idea of what to do. When we're looking at drivers, um, like track history and stuff, I personally am not concerned about that. I'm concerned about how they're racing specifically. Go back and watch races. Really analyze them. Watch, watch what the drivers are doing. Watch how teams approach. Watch how organizations approach stuff. You'll find a lot of similarities at... Daytona and Talladega of how people approach, and then you'll see kind of stuff gets mixed up because the good guys are able to shine at Atlanta, you know? Um, so that's where I'm at. Hopefully it helps you out. I'll see you guys next week. Enjoy, uh, just enjoy uh, NFL Week 1, I guess. I don't know. Watch Atlanta, way better than, than NFL. Talk to you guys later.